So, you want me to read you some stories again? <sighs> oh, I don't mind, of course. All right then, darling, here's Constance, A Poetical Romance. Long years had passed. Fair peace with gentle rain ruled o'er the land in willing bondage held. While from the borders of her vast domain were linked the golden fetters that of Eld, forged by the cunning wisdom that could weld the souls of men by fire of eloquence, made of her son's true hearts her sure defence. O land of happy memories, how blessed of heaven! O land to patriot hearts, how dear! On thee, O sunny haven of the west, from budding spring the opening of the year, till autumn crowns her glorious career. Doth nature, with unrivalled splendour, pour her choicest blessings from her boundless store, and sped to distant land, on eastern gales, the news of thy fair paradise, and came, full many an argosy, with swelling sails, their lordship o'er the envied realm to claim, and plant their standards in the royal name, in soil to freedom consecrate alone, who other sovereign eye refused to own. Then drifting clouds the brightness of her sky began to dim, and distant thundering announced that war with dread approach was nigh. And last, fair peace unsoiled her snowy wing, flew back to heaven's high courts, and wondering looked down. The while her pitying teardrops fell, if aught so pure war's tempest might dispel. But fiercely burst the storm, and discord reigned, yet lived their noble hearts amid those days. Who mid all change, unchanging, still remained. For these, zero, tuneful muse, I bid thee raise, in sweetest strain, thy loftiest notes of praise, in name of honour and in gentler name of deathless love, through adverse fate the same. Six. The unseen minstrel long had silent been, but at the well-known themes her hidden fire awoke once more, and trembling within. Like winds that breathe through an Aeolian lyre, grew deep and strong with passionate desire, and to her sounding harp once more she sang, to rock and wood with sweetest echoes. The meeting. The setting sun with level ray, as all too short his welcome stay, paused, gilding with a fiery flood high towering hills and bordering wood, where wound its way with babbling song, a mountain brook that gleamed among the emerald hills, a silver chain, twixt upland height and lowland plain, where first the hilltops came to view a noble boundary line they drew, that arched the heavens with mighty span to where the lowlier woods began. These in their turn enriched the scene with darker hues of rustling green. Then merged in meadows broad and fair, whose silken banners waved in air, did homage to fly passing breeze, and nodded to the whispering trees, the laughing brook here spent its force, and holding still its wayward course, yet widened to a broader bed with sluggish current overspread, whose pebbly bottom gleaming through each nook and shoal revealed anew. Where hid the angler's speckled prey, or shot like light upon his way? Here crossed a narrow lane that wound far upward o'er the uneven ground, till on the mountain's topmost height, by copse and brush, t'was hid from sight. No foot had trod its pathway bare since last the sunlight lingered there, nor, from the earliest gleam of dawn, had timid deer or startled fawn crossed the wide mead, or at the brink of the clear water stooped to drink. But nature, undisturbed that day, had dreamed the golden hours away. Now, through the richly glowing light, a single horseman came in sight, distant at first, then drawing near, and urging on in full career his noble steed that lightly flew, as near and nearer still he drew, crossed the wide brook with easy bound, and galloped o'er the uprising ground. Intent to reach the distant height, ere fell the approaching shades of night, the rider's nodding plume and blade of war's pursuit confession made. Not many years had passed him o'er, though manhood's fullest prime he bore, and though life's care had left him press, was scarcely more than light caress in passing, as her hand had stayed ere mark indelible was made, and bade him still youth's honours wear, who their light weight so well could bear. Now up the steep ascent they pressed, nor paused to breathe, nor stopped to rest. Until the lofty summit gained, his horse the rider lightly reined, and leaping from the saddle stood to view the leafy solitude, 
where nature's lavish hand displayed what store her boundless wealth had made. On either hand, like walls of strength, the hills drew out their endless length. Opposing ranges dimly seen at distance were, while lay between a fertile vale of wide extent, with summer's growth luxuriant. The brooklet from the mountainside swelled a deep river's flowing tide that through broad mead and verdant leas stretched onward to the distant sea. On nearer side, a rocky ledge sought with bold sweep the water's edge. Then back retiring left a plain, or table in the mountain chain, that seemed by natural fitness made for garrison or ambuscade. Pursuing here biz endless round, a single sentry paced the ground. Beneath a mighty army lay, whose tents in orderly array the level meadow dotted o'er. From mountain range to sloping shore, anon was heard the soldier's song whose chorus reached his listening ear like alpine echoes borne along by varying winds, now far, now near. Soldier's song. When ceased the battle's roar, war's thunders heard no more. For briefest holiday, idly the soldier may rest, idly rest, ring out a merry shout, tell in gallant measure, twixt strife the soldier's life still is life of pleasure, when beats the light reveil, soldier and sentinel. <sighs> you know, this might be a little too much to make you sleep, don't you think? Fine, I'll keep going. Merlin. I don't even know where you got this book. Quick to their stations come, and at the tap of drum, stand ready, stand, ring out with fearless shout, challenge to the foemen. At dawn, with weapons drawn, stands each sturdy yeoman. Then at the trumpet's sound, shakes neath their tread the ground. Footmen and cavalry, lancers, artillery, march, onward march, ring out, inspiring shout. And with war drums rattle, swell high the loyal cry, signal for the battle. Now in the deadly front, bearing the battle's brunt. But with undaunted will, bravely the soldier still on, presses on. Ring out victorious shout, tell the noble story. Low in the western heaven the sun, still lingering ere his race was run, a flood of golden slender poured o'er the rich vale and teeming sward. Then sank from view, as loudly spoke the evening gun, and straight awoke the rattling echoes sharper sound from hill to hill with quick rebound, as viewless elves that slumbered there had waked to revel in the air. Scarce was the first loud echo heard, ere from its staff like wounded bird that folds its wings and stoops to die. Slid down the silken canopy that high in air with breezy play had floated since the dawn of day. Then dim by distance came the tramp of warder marching through the camp, while hoarse command and clang of arms rang through the air their loud alarms. <sighs> okay, darling, I'm sorry. I need to read something that'll give you nice dreams. Is that all right? Right then, thank you, my love. All right, I got this one. The Little Moon, Men. Once upon a time there was a little boy who did not always do what's right. He tried to stay awake all night. One evening, when mother and father had tried to coax him to go to sleep, old Aunt Rachel, the coloured mammy, came clumpity clump clump upstairs. She took the little boy in her arms and rocked to and fro in the old rocking chair. As they went rocking to and fro, the little boy stared at the great moon and said, I don't like a sleepy song. I want to stay up all night long. At this the old mammy pretended she did not hear and said, Little men, little men, skipping o'er the hill and glen. Little men, little men, carry sacks of dreams. What then? Little men, here they all come out again. Who are the little men? asked the little boy. Mammy rocked to and fro and said, See them creeping over the moon. One will be in your bedroom soon. Then the most surprising thing happened. The little boy looked, and up over the moon crept a wee little man with a sack on his back. There came another and another and another. Would they never stop coming? As they came nearer and nearer and nearer, you could even hear the song one little man was singing. Rock away, rock away, to and fro. I'll bring a rocking chair dream, you know. One little man came so near, you could hear the patter, patter, patter of his little feet. Then he danced right on the window and said, Hello, bright eyes. I'll tickle your toes. I'm in earnest, goodness knows. 
Before Mammy or the little boy could say a word, in came the little man and tickled the boy. The little man taunted. Nid, nid, nodding goes your head. Ha, ha, ho, ho, it's time for bed. At this very minute, the little boy nodded. Then the little man kissed both cheeks and said, Rock away, rock away, sleeping till the break of day. As the little boy fell fast asleep, the little man took a beautiful dream out of his bag. And he and the little boy joined hands and skipped away, away, away. Isn't this better, darling? Of course, now this story seems creepy, but... Oh, whatever. A visit to the goose. The door flew open almost before Rudolph had stopped knocking, but there was nothing very alarming about the person who stood on the threshold. Anne said afterward she had thought at first it was a Miss Spriggins who came sometimes to sew for her mother, but it was not. It was only a very large grey goose, neatly dressed in blue and white bed ticking, with a large white apron tied round her waist and wearing big spectacles with black rims to them. Nothing today, thank you, said the goose. But please, began Rudolph, no soap, no baking powder, no lightning rods, no hearth brooms, no cake tins, no life insurance. Rattled the goose so rapidly that the children could hardly understand her. Nothing at all today, thank you. But we want something, Anne cried. We want to come in. I never let in peddlers, said the goose, and she slammed the door in their faces. As she slammed it, one of her broad apron strings caught in the crack, and Rudolph seized the end of it. When the goose opened the door an inch or so to free herself, he held on firmly and said, Tell us, please, are you the warming pan's aunt? The grey goose looked immensely pleased, but shook her head. Nothing so simple, said she, nor so to speak commonplace, since the relationship or connection, if you will have it, is, though perfectly to be distinguished, not always, as it were, entirely clear through his great-grandfather, who, as I hope you are aware, was a Dutch oven, having run away with a cousin of my mother's uncle's stepfather, who was three times married, numbers one, two and three, all having children, but none of them resembling one another in the slightest, which, as you may have perceived, is only the beginning of the story, but if you will now come in, not forgetting to wipe your feet and try to follow me very carefully, I'll be delighted to explain all particulars. The children were glad to follow the Lady Goose into the house, though they thought she had been quite particular enough. They found it impossible to wipe their feet upon the mat because it was thick with snow, and when the door was closed behind them, they were surprised to feel that it was snowing even harder inside the house than it was out. For a moment they stood half-blinded by the storm, unable to see clearly what kind of room they were in, or to tell whose were the voices they heard so plainly. A great fluttering, cackling and complaining was going on close to them, and a hoarse voice cried out, one hundred and seventeen and three quarters feathers to be multiplied by two sevenths of a pound. That's a sweet one. Do that if you can, Squealer. You can't do it yourself, a whining voice replied. I've tried the back and the corners and the edges. There's no more room. Then came the sound of a sudden smack, as if someone's ears had been boxed when he least expected it, and this was followed by a loud angry squawk. Now the flakes, which had been gradually thinning, died away entirely, and the children suddenly discovered that they had not been snowflakes at all, but only a cloud of white feathers sent whirling through the house, out of the windows, and up the chimney by some disturbance in the midst of a great heap in one corner of the room as high as a haystack. From the middle of this heap of feathers stuck up two very thin yellow legs with shabby boots that gave one last despairing kick and then were still. Nearby, at a counter, a gentleman goose in a long apron was weighing feathers on a very small pair of scales, and at his elbow stood a little duck apprentice with the tears running down his cheeks. He was doing sums in a greasy sort of butcher's book that seemed quite full already of funny scratchy figures. That must be Squealer, the one who got his ears boxed, whispered Anne to Rudolph. But what do you suppose is the matter with the other duck, the one in the heap? He will be smothered. I know he will. Rudolph thought so too, yet it didn't seem polite to mention it. The Lady Goose had been busily helping the children to brush off the feathers that were sticking to them, and patting Peter on the back with her bill, because he said he was sure he had swallowed at least a pound. She now brought forward chairs for them all. 
As the children looked around more closely, they saw that the room they were in was a very cosy sort of place, long and low and neatly furnished with a white deal table, a shiny black cook stove, a great many bright copper saucepans and a red geranium in the window. A large iron pot was boiling merrily on the stove, and from time to time the grey goose stirred its contents with a wooden spoon. It smelled rather good, and Peter, sniffing, began to put on his hungry expression. No, not even a family resemblance, went on the grey goose waving her spoon. Although, as is generally known, a Roman nose is characteristic in our family, having developed, in fact, at the time of that little affair when we repelled the Gauls in the year. But Rudolph felt he could not stand much more of this. I beg your pardon, he interrupted. But would you mind if we help the little one out of the heap, the... the duck who is getting so thoroughly smothered? Not at all. If you care about it, said the grey goose kindly. Squawker will be good now, won't he, father? Oh, I'm sure he'll be good, Anne cried, and she ran ahead of Rudolph to catch hold of one of the thin yellow legs and give it a mighty pull. He'll be good, said the gentleman goose gravely, speaking for the first time, when he's roasted. Very good indeed will Squawker be, with apple sauce. And he smacked his lips and winked at Peter, who was standing close beside him, looking up earnestly into his face. Peter thought a moment, then he said, I likes currant jelly on my duck, I eats apple sauce on goose. The gentleman goose appeared suddenly uncomfortable. He began nervously stuffing little parcels of the feathers he had been weighing into small blue and white striped bags, which he threw one after the other to Squealer who never by any chance caught them as he turned his back at every throw. I suppose, said the gentleman goose to Peter in a hesitating, anxious sort of voice, you believe along with all the rest, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, don't you? I suppose there's nothing saucy about yourself now, is there? And apparently comforted by his miserable little joke, he went on with his weighing, by this time the other little duck had been hauled out of the heap of feathers by Anne and Rudolph and stood coughing and sneezing and gasping in the middle of the floor. As soon as he had breath enough, he began calling pity fully for someone to brush the down off his Sunday trousers. The grey goose came good-naturedly to his assistance, but as she brushed him all the wrong way, the children couldn't see that she improved him very much. Squawker seemed quite pleased, however, and turned himself round and round for their approval. "'What kind of birds are these new ones?' he asked the Lady Goose when she had finished with him. "'Why, just three more of us, Squawker, clear,' she answered. This remark made all three children open their eyes very wide. "'Nonsense!' began Rudolph angrily. "'We aren't geese!' from the other end of the room came the voice of the gentleman goose who spoke without turning round what makes you think that he asked because we aren't we you're molting pretty badly of course now you mention it interrupted the lady goose you and the little one but this one's feathers seem in nice condition as she spoke she laid a long claw lovingly on Anne's head how much would you say a pound father can't say till I get him in the scales, of course. And smoothing down his apron, the gentleman goose advanced toward Anne in a businesslike fashion. The two little apprentices, carrying bags, followed at his heels. Anne clung to Rudolph. I haven't any feathers, she screamed. They're curls. I'm not a nasty bird. I'm a little girl with hair. She doesn't want to be plucked exclaimed the grey goose who had returned to the stove to stir the contents of the iron pot. Well, now, did you ever? Maybe it goes in her family. I had a great aunt once on my father's side who... They're feathers, all right, chuckled Squawker. You're a perfect little duck, that's what I think. Me too, chimed in Squealer. The gentleman goose reached over the lady goose's shoulder, snatched the spectacles off her nose without so much as by your leave, set them crookedly on his own and looked over them long and earnestly at Anne. So you want to call them hair, do you? He snapped. I suppose you think you belong in a hair mattress. Anne was ready to cry, and Rudolph had drawn his sword with the intention of doing his best to protect her, when at that moment a new voice was heard. 
Looking in at the little window over the top of the red geranium, the children saw a good-humoured furry face with long bristly whiskers and bright twinkly eyes. Anybody mention my name? said the voice, and a large Belgian hare leapt lightly into the room. He was handsomely dressed in a light overcoat and check trousers, and wore gaiters over his patent leather boots. He had a thick gold watch chain, gold studs, and cuff buttons besides other jewellery, and in one hand he carried a high hat, in the other a small dress suit case, and a tightly rolled umbrella. What's the matter here? he inquired cheerfully. Why, this bird, explained the gentleman goose, pointing his claw disdainfully at Anne, says it has no feathers, which you can see for yourself is not the case. It has feathers there, for it is a bird. Birds of a feather flock together. That settles it, I think. Come along, boys, to work. At his command, the two duck apprentices, who were standing one on either side of Anne, made feeble dashes at the two long curls nearest them. Rudolph stepped forward, but the hare was before him. He only needed to stare at the two ducks through a single eyeglass he had screwed into one of his eyes to make them turn pale and drop their claws to their sides. Now once more, said the hare to Anne, what did you say you call those unpleasantly long whiskers of yours? Hare, Anne answered meekly, for she was too frightened to be offended. Hare, echoed Rudolph and Peter loudly. Bless me, said their new friend, that's not at all my business, is it? Not at all in my line. Oh, no. He gathered up his hat, dress suitcase, and little umbrella from the floor where he had dropped them. Be sure you don't follow me, he said, nodding pleasantly and winking at the children. Then he stepped to the door without so much as a look at the gentleman goose, who called out angrily, Stop, stop, catch him, squealer! Adam! Squawker! Hold him, boys! It was too late. The boys were too much afraid of the hare to do more than flutter and squawk a little, and as the gentleman goose did not seem inclined to make an attack single-handed, the hare, with the children behind him, got to the door in safety. Peter, however, had to be dragged along by Anne and Rudolph, for the lady goose had just removed the great pot from the stove in time to prevent its contents from boiling over, and the little boy was sniffing hungrily at the steam. Now she came after the children, carrying a large spoonful of the bubbling stuffy. All done, all done, she cried. Don't go without a taste, dears. What's done? asked Peter, eagerly turning back to her. Worms, dear, red ones and brown ones, answered the lady goose. Boiled in vinegar, you know, just like mother used to make, with a wee bit of a grasshopper here and there for flavouring. Mother had the recipe handed down in her family, her side. You know, from my great-great-grandmother's half-sister, who was a day one oi, but married a Mr. Gans and was potted in the year. They got Peter through the door by main force. Anne and Rudolph pushing behind and the hare pulling in front. Even then, I'm ashamed to say, Peter kept calling out that he would like just a taste, and he didn't see why the goose's worms wouldn't be just as good as the white kind cook sent up with cheese on the top. How are you still up? Oh, Merlin, a couple more stories, and I'm going to bed too, my love. Oh, how about some Edgar Allan Poe, darling? During the whole of a dull, dark and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country and at length found myself, as the shades of the evening drew on, within view of the melancholy house of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. I say insufferable, for the feeling was unrelieved by any of that half-pleasurable because poetic sentiment with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate or terrible. I looked upon the scene before me, upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like windows, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees, with an utter depression of soul which I can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after-dream of the reveller upon opium the bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping off of the veil. There was an iciness, a sinking, 
a sickening of the heart, an unredeemed dreariness of thought which no goading of the imagination could torture into aught of the sublime. What was it, I paused to think, what was it that so unnerved me in the contemplation of the House of Usher? It was a mystery all insoluble, nor could I grapple with the shadowy fancies that crowded upon me as I pondered. I was forced to fall back upon the unsatisfactory conclusion that while beyond doubt there are combinations of very simple natural objects which have the power of thus affecting us, still the analysis of this power lies among considerations beyond our depth. It was possible, I reflected, that a mere different arrangement of the particulars of the scene, of the details of the picture, would be sufficient to modify, or perhaps to annihilate, its capacity for sorrowful impression. And acting upon this idea, I reined my horse to the precipitous brink of a black and lurid tarn that lay in unruffled luster by the dwelling, and gazed down, but with a shudder even more thrilling than before, upon the remodelled and inverted images of the grey sedge and the ghastly tree stems, and the vacant and eye-like windows. Nevertheless, in this mansion of gloom, I now propose to myself a sojourn of some weeks. Its proprietor, Roderick Usher, had been one of my boon companions in boyhood, but many years had elapsed since our last meeting. A letter, however, had lately reached me in a distant part of the country, a letter from him, which, in its wildly importunate nature, had admitted of no other than a personal reply. The MS gave evidence of nervous agitation. The writer spoke of acute bodily illness, of a mental disorder which oppressed him, and of an earnest desire to see me as his best and indeed his only personal friend, with a view of attempting by the cheerfulness of my society some alleviation of his malady. It was the manner in which all this, and much more, was said. It was the apparent heart that went with his request, which allowed me no room for hesitation, and I accordingly obeyed forthwith what I still considered a very singular summons. Although as boys we had been even intimate associates, yet I really knew little of my friend. His reserve had been always excessive and habitual. I was aware, however, that his very ancient family had been noted, time out of mind, for a peculiar sensibility of temperament, displaying itself through long ages in many works of exalted art and manifested of late in repeated deeds of munificent yet unobtrusive charity, as well as in a passionate devotion to the intricacies, perhaps even more than to the orthodox and easily recognisable beauties of musical science. I had learned, too, the very remarkable fact that the stem of the Usher race, all time honoured as it was, had put forth at no period any enduring branch. In other words, that the entire family lay in the direct line of descent, and had always, with very trifling and very temporary variation, so lain. It was this deficiency I considered while running over in thought the perfect keeping of the character of the premises with the accredited character of the people, and while speculating upon the possible influence which the one, in the long lapse of centuries, might have exercised upon the other, it was this deficiency, perhaps, of collateral issue and the consequent undeviating transmission from sire to son of the patrimony with the name which had at length so identified the two as to merge the original title of the estate in the quaint and equivocal appellation of the House of Usher, an appellation which seemed to include, in the minds of the peasantry who used it, both the family and the family mansion. I have said that the sole effect of my somewhat childish experiment, that of looking down within the tarn, had been to deepen the first singular impression. There can be no doubt that the consciousness of the rapid increase of my superstition, for why should I not so term it, served mainly to accelerate the increase itself. Such, I have long known, is the paradoxical law of all sentiments having terror as a basis. And it might have been for this reason only that when I again uplifted my eyes to the house itself from its image in the pool, there grew in my mind a strange fancy. A fancy so ridiculous indeed that I but mention it to show the vivid force of the sensations which oppressed me. I had so worked upon my imagination as really to believe that about the whole mansion and domain there hung an atmosphere peculiar to themselves and their immediate vicinity. An atmosphere which had no affinity with the air of heaven, but which had reeked up from the decayed trees and the grey wall and the silent tarn, a pestilent and mystic vapour, dull, sluggish, 
faintly discernible and leaden-hued. Shaking off from my spirit what must have been a dream, I scanned more narrowly the real aspect of the building. Its principal features seemed to be that of an excessive antiquity. The discoloration of ages had been great. Minute fungi overspread the whole exterior, hanging in a fine, tangled webwork from the eaves. Yet all this was apart from any extraordinary dilapidation. No portion of the masonry had fallen, and there appeared to be a wild inconsistency between its still perfect adaptation of parts and the crumbling condition of the individual stones. In this, there was much that reminded me of the specious totality of old woodwork which has rotted for long years in some neglected vault, with no disturbance from the breath of the external air. Beyond this indication of extensive decay, however, the fabric gave little token of instability. Perhaps the eye of a scrutinising observer might have discovered a barely perceptible fissure, which, extending from the roof of the building in front, made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction, until it became lost in the sullen waters of the tarn. Noticing these things, I rode over a short causeway to the house. A servant in waiting took my horse, and I entered the gothic archway of the hall. A valet of stealthy step thence conducted me in silence, through many dark and intricate passages in my progress to the studio of his master. Much that I encountered on the way contributed, I know not how, to heighten the vague sentiments of which I have already spoken. While the objects around me, while the carvings of the ceilings, the sombre tapestries of the walls, the ebony blackness of the floors, and the phantasmagoric armorial trophies which rattled as I strode, were but matters to which, or to such as which, I had been accustomed from my infancy, while I hesitated not to acknowledge how familiar was all this, I still wondered to find how unfamiliar were the fancies which ordinary images were stirring up. On one of the staircases, I met the physician of the family. His countenance, I thought, wore a mingled expression of low cunning and perplexity. He accosted me with trepidation and passed on. The valet now threw open a door and ushered me into the presence of his master. The room in which I found myself was very large and lofty. The windows were long, narrow and pointed, and at so vast a distance from the black oaken floor as to be altogether inaccessible from within. Feeble gleams of encrimsoned light made their way through the trellised panes and served to render sufficiently distinct the more prominent objects around. The eye, however, struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the chamber or the recesses of the vaulted and fretted ceiling. Dark draperies hung upon the walls, the general furniture was profuse, comfortless, antique and tattered. Many books and musical instruments lay scattered about, but failed to give any vitality to the scene. I felt that I breathed an atmosphere of sorrow. An air of stern, deep and irredeemable gloom hung over and pervaded all. Upon my entrance, Usher rose from a sofa on which he had been lying at full length and greeted me with a vivacious warmth which had much in it, I at first thought, of an overdone cordiality, of the constrained effort of the ennui man of the world. A glance, however, at his countenance convinced me of his perfect sincerity. We sat down, and for some moments, while he spoke not, I gazed upon him with a feeling half of pity, half of awe. Surely man had never before so terribly altered in so brief a period as had Roderick Usher. It was with difficulty that I could bring myself to admit the identity of the man being before me with the companion of my early boyhood. Yet the character of his face had been at all times remarkable, a cadaverousness of complexion, an eye large and luminous beyond comparison, lips somewhat thin and very pallid but of a surpassingly beautiful curve, a nose of a delicate Hebrew model but with a breadth of nostril unusual in similar formations, a finely moulded chin speaking in its want of prominence of a want of moral energy. Hair of a more than web-like softness and tenuity, these features, with an inordinate expansion above the regions of the temple, made up altogether a countenance not easily to be forgotten. And now in the mere exaggeration of the prevailing character of these features, and of the expression they were wont to convey, lay so much of change that I doubted to whom I spoke. The now ghastly pallor of the skin, and the now miraculous lustre of the eye, above all things startled and even awed me. The silken hair too had been suffered to grow all unheeded, 
and as in its wild gossamer texture it floated rather than fell about the face, I could not, even with effort, connect its arabesque expression with any idea of simple humanity. In the manner of my friend, I was at once struck with an incoherence, an inconsistency, and I soon found this to arise from a series of feeble and futile struggles to overcome an habitual trepidancy, an excessive nervous agitation. For something of this nature I had indeed been prepared, no less by his letter than by reminiscences of certain boyish traits, and by conclusions deduced from his peculiar physical conformation and temperament. His action was alternately vivacious and sullen. His voice varied rapidly from a tremulous indecision when the animal spirit seemed utterly in abeyance, to that species of energetic concision, that abrupt, weighty, unhurried and hollow-sounding enunciation, that leaden, self-balanced and perfectly modulated guttural utterance, which may be observed in the lost drunkard or the irreclaimable eater of opium, during the periods of his most intense excitement. It was thus that he spoke of the object of my visit, of his earnest desire to see me, and of the solace he expected me to afford him. He entered at some length into what he conceived to be the nature of his malady. It was, he said, a constitutional and a family evil, and one for which he despaired to find a remedy, a mere nervous affection, he immediately added, which would undoubtedly soon pass off. It displayed itself in a host of unnatural sensations. Some of these, as he detailed them, interested and bewildered me, although perhaps the terms and the general manner of the narration had their weight. He suffered much from a morbid acuteness of the senses. The most insipid food was alone endurable. He could wear only garments of certain texture. The odours of all flowers were oppressive. His eyes were tortured by even a faint light, and there were but peculiar sounds, and these from stringed instruments, which did not inspire him with horror. To an anomalous species of terror, I found him a bounden slave. I shall perish, said he. I must perish in this deplorable folly. Thus, thus, and not otherwise shall I be lost. I dread the events of the future, not in themselves, but in their results. I shudder at the thought of any, even the most trivial incident, which may operate upon this intolerable agitation of soul. I have indeed no abhorrence of danger except in its absolute effect, in terror. In this unnerved, in this pitiable condition, I feel that the period will sooner or later arrive when I must abandon life and reason together in some struggle with the grim phantasm, fear. I learned, moreover, at intervals and through broken and equivocal hints, another singular feature of his mental condition. He was enchained by certain superstitious impressions in regard to the dwelling which he tenanted, and whence, for many years, he had never ventured forth in regard to an influence whose supposititious force was conveyed in terms too shadowy here to be restated, an influence which some peculiarities in the mere form and substance of his family mansion had, by dint of long sufferance, he said, obtained over his spirit an effect which the physique of the grey walls and turrets, and of the dim tarn into which they all looked down, had at length brought about upon the morale of his existence. He admitted, however, although with hesitation, that much of the peculiar gloom which thus afflicted him could be traced to a more natural and far more palpable origin to the severe and long-continued illness, indeed to the evidently approaching dissolution of a tenderly beloved sister, his sole companion for long years, his last and only relative on earth. Her decease, he said with a bitterness which I can never forget, would leave him, him the hopeless and the frail, the last of the ancient race of the ushers. While he spoke, the Lady Madeline, for so was she called, passed slowly through a remote portion of the apartment, and without having noticed my presence, disappeared. I regarded her with an utter astonishment not unmingled with dread, and yet I found it impossible to account for such feelings. A sensation of stupor oppressed me as my eyes followed her retreating steps. When a door at length closed upon her, my glance sought instinctively and eagerly the countenance of the brother, but he had buried his face in his hands, and I could only perceive that a far more than ordinary wanness had overspread the emaciated fingers through which trickled many passionate tears. The disease of the Lady Madeline had long baffled the skill of her physicians. 
a settled apathy, a gradual wasting away of the person, and frequent, although transient, affections of a partially cataleptical character were the unusual diagnosis. Hitherto she had steadily borne up against the pressure of her malady and had not betaken herself finally to bed. But on the closing in of the evening of my arrival at the house, she succumbed, as her brother told me at night, with inexpressible agitation, to the prostrating power of the destroyer. And I learned that the glimpse I had obtained of her person would thus probably be the last I should obtain, that the lady, at least while living, would be seen by me no more. Oh! Darling. Oh, darling. Sleep well, my love.